Coming up on this week's episode of The Doctor's Pharmacy, Dr. Hyman travels to Park City, Utah to receive stem cell therapy for his own pain and mobility issues. Prior to receiving treatment, Dr. Hyman sits down for a conversation with the doctors he'll be working with. We recorded this episode in their clinic, which is the reason for the reduction in audio quality you're about to hear. Now let's dive into this fascinating discussion around stem cells and why they are a major player in the future of medicine. Welcome to the Doctor's Pharmacy. I'm Dr. Mark Hyman. Uh, this is a place for conversations that matter. And that's pharmacy with an F, F-A-R-M-A-C-Y. And today we have a very interesting conversation about a topic many people are interested in, which is stem cells and something you may never heard about, which is exosomes. And of course, how we can help ourselves age well and not get sick and have all kinds of problems as we age. And we're here with some really extraordinary scientists, doctors, uh, and leaders of the future in the world of stem cells and exosomes and regenerative medicine, which basically means how do you regenerate yourself so you're younger and healthier, which I'm all about because I want to be 120. <laughs> Dave Asprey, my buddy, says he wants to be 180. I'm not that competitive, but I uh, like I don't know what I do all extra time. I can't go cross country skiing. Um, and I'm here because not only do I want to talk to these extraordinary physicians, but I want to get better myself. Uh, 27 years ago, I had back surgery for a ruptured disc and ended up with some consequences that have kind of plagued me and now are coming to roost. So I had a weak leg, I've limped for 27 years, uh, and now my back pain is starting to act up uh, even more. And I really have come here to see uh, the doctors, Dr. Adelson, Dr. Killen, and Dr. Duckworth, to get my back sorted out so I can continue to be active and healthy and fit. And uh, I want to give you a little bit of background on these, these docs because they, they're a pretty uh, unusual group who have uh, been leading this field. Uh, Dr. Adelson Harry is one of the early doctors who used the stem cells for the treatment of chronic uh, musculoskeletal pain. He's performed over 6,000 stem cell procedures, has injected stem cells into a 1,000 intervertebral discs, making him probably among the most experienced in the world using uh, stem cells that come from people's own bodies, not some other stem cells from another person. Uh, and uh, he's the inventor of something called the Full Body Stem Cell Makeover, uh, and is founder of the Sarah Clinics located in beautiful Park City, Utah, which is where we are right now. And I'm about to go under anesthesia and get all this stuff done to me, so I'm very excited about it. Dr. Killen, sitting next to me here, is uh, a nationally recognized anti-aging and regenerative physician specializing in aesthetics and sexual optimization. We're gonna talk about that. that sounds like a good thing. Um, she uh, merges diet, lifestyle, integrated medicine with stem cell medicine to give her patients the most effective cutting edge therapies currently available. And she practices with Dr. Harry Adelson here in Park City. Lucky them <laughs> in the mountains. His view out of the office is just stunning with mountains and estuaries and it's just incredible. Uh, not estuary because we're in the middle of the mountains, but it's a, a lake or wetlands. Uh, Dr. Duckworth also is here. He's an anesthesiologist. Uh, he's an a dentist anesthesiologist, but I never actually heard of before. He's residency trained. He's uh, trained uh, at the University of Southern California's Austro School of Dentistry and then completed residency at Stony Brook University. Uh, he's done rotations in cardiology, pain management, ambulatory anesthesia, post anesthesia care, internal pediatric medicine, pretty much done it all. And he leads our team here in, um, in anesthesia. So I'm looking forward to. Uh, you're putting me to sleep <laughs> As <I'm learning. laughs> So, so let, let's start off um, first talking about stem cells because we hear a lot of news about it. We hear a lot of hype about it. We don't exactly know what it is. You know, there's a lot of regulatory issues around it. It's highly controlled. Uh, there's a lot of promise. It's going to fix everything and cure everything. So what are stem cells and what is the science of stem cells and, and, and what is the promise of stem cells? Let's just start with Dr. Allison sure. and then we'll go to Amy and then we'll get Sure, into so our body is comprised of many different types of cells. Most notably, there's tissue type cells, such as muscle cells or bone cells or nerve cells. But then we have this other category of cell called stem cells. And stem cells are a primitive cell that have what I say, there's two superhuman powers. One of their superhuman powers is they're able to, when they self-renew, they're able to either turn into a target tissue cell, such as a bone cell or a muscle cell, but they also have the ability to, uh, to self-renew, which is just turn into a new version of themselves. Mm -hmm. And that actually is the definition of a stem cell. A stem mm -hmm. cell can either turn into a new version of itself or it can turn into a target tissue cell. 
Then with the second superhuman power, which really is much more important in this conversation when we're talking about the therapeutic use, is their ability to exert what's called a paracrine effect. And a paracrine effect is intercellular communication. A stem cell has the ability to recognize when it's in the presence of a damaged cell or a damaged tissue. Mm. And then it releases signal proteins that signal that damaged tissue to heal itself. Mm. So in a natural circumstance, when you have any sort of injury at all and you have healing after that injury, it is a stem cell mediated event. So that's what happens in nature when you just have an injury and you heal. The stem cells are what are responsible for healing. Therapeutically, what we do is you, you say you have an injury and you, you experience what we call suboptimal healing. So you don't completely heal. You don't go completely back to normal. So then what we do in regenerative medicine is we take stem cells from an area where you still have a robust population, namely your bone marrow, and your fat, and then we put those stem cells in this area of suboptimal healing, essentially tricking your body into thinking that you've sustained a new injury without actually having caused any tissue damage, thereby launching the body's natural healing cascade. Amazing. So essentially, it's it's twofold. The first is you get a sperm and an egg, which are two cells. They merge, and they become everything in your body. They become your brain. They become your bones. They become your liver which is kind of cool. And so in a sense, these stem cells are like those embryonic cells that then turn into everything. And you, you said they have this, this potential to become any other tissue. So they're like kind of smart cells. Right. Well, what embryonic cells are when you have the sperm and the egg and you have an embryo. An embryo is just a ball of eight cells. And those cells have the ability to turn into absolutely anything. But in our own body as adults, we still have stem cells that aren't quite, they don't have the ability to turn into absolutely anything, but they have the ability to turn into many different types of things. And those are called adult stem cells. And that's what we practice is the use of adult stem cells. And they're also sort of like a smart bomb in a way. They, they sort of like an intelligent targeted missile that goes to wherever the problem is. So you think you just inject stem cells in the blood, how do they know where to go? Well, they, they're sort of like a heat seeking missile and they go to where the issues are and help the body start to activate its healing mechanisms, right? They, 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 have a, they do a homing uh, mechanism where they home to the damaged tissue and they exert their effect there. So um, we continue to make these stem cells. Are they, as we age, are they less effective? Would you like to answer that? Yeah, I mean, you, you still have stem cells throughout your life. Um, as you age, you begin to have fewer stem cells in certain parts of the body, and then the ones you have don't don't have quite as much of a robust response, um, so they don't work quite as well. So you still have them, um, but maybe they're not working quite as well. And that's one of the things that causes aging as you get older. Um, so, but what we're doing is moving the stem cells, you know, where you have a lot of them, and putting them in places where where you you really need them, whether that's your lower back or or your face or whatever it is, so that we can give you extra stem cells in those areas. But I'm 59. Are my stem cells like? Awesome, or are they like kind of 59 year old stem cells? Well, you've I mean. still got some good stem cells. I mean, <laughs> certainly, you know, certainly younger probably is better as far as the sort of the vitality and robustness of stem cells, um, but you still have plenty of stem cells at this point. So, in a way, getting it from a baby or a placenta seems like a better idea, right? Um, there, that is a good idea, and there's a lot of work being done on like placental and umbilical stem cells, um, and certainly there's some really cool research being done with those types of cells. This is full-term babies, this is not embryos, you know, full-term babies who are delivered and they just take the placenta mm. or the umbilical cords. Yeah. Um, so certainly there's a lot of work with that. In the U.S., we can't take those cells and culture expand them to make a bunch of them and give them back to someone, um, but a lot of other countries are doing that and are having a lot of success. But so there's more we'll risk with that. that because it's not your tissue, right? So there's more risk for problems. It's not your tissue, but with the types of cells we're using, the mesenchymal stem cells, which is the type of adult stem cell that, that we're using, um, you actually don't mount an immune response. That's your own it. cells. Well, it's your cells, but even if I was to give you someone else's mesenchymal stem cells, they're what we call immunoprivileged um, or immunoevasive. So you actually don't have an immune response to those cells. So we could put, and we don't do that here, but someone could put other types of mesenchymal stem cells in your body from someone else and your immune system wouldn't really see them. 
um, they would be able to just hang out and do their job without your immune system attacking them. So it's a little different than like bone marrow transplants that you would hear about for, you know, other types of like lymphomas and things like that. Um, so it's a different type of cell that it has the potential to be used in all different people. Amazing. So, okay, so let's talk about the, the therapeutic potential in your experience because you, you've done over 6,000 stem cell procedures, which is mm -hmm. just mind boggling. I don't even know how many years that is, how many days, 6,000, a lot of days, <laughs> 20, 20 years, years of stem cell. Um, and you were one of the early adopters, you had tremendous experience. So how did you get started with this? And tell us about your background and why did you start doing this? Well, I started out doing a, uh, something called prolotherapy, which really okay. can be viewed as the predecessor to stem cell therapy. So prolotherapy is also called regenerative injection therapy. And I got into it personally because when I was in naturopathic school, I had a shoulder injury. I was rock climbing and I was doing this hard move and I felt this pop in my shoulder. And I went to a surgeon and he said, well, you've torn a piece of cartilage in your shoulder. Um, I can put a scope in there and cut it away. It'll help you in the short term, but it's gonna cause you problems later in life. And here I was at the time, I was I think 24 years old. I was very healthy. And I was in naturopathic school where they teach the healing power of nature. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know, this just doesn't make any sense to me. Like there's gotta be a way to kickstart my healing response. Mm -hmm. And we didn't have the term biohacking back then. I'm not even sure we had the term hacking back then, <laughs> in the mid nineties, but you know, I just, it, it was really, I, I, there had to be some way I could biohack this. And I found out about uh, the man who was to become my mentor, Dr. Rick Marinelli, who was the first naturopath to do prolotherapy. And what prolotherapy is, is it's the injection of a natural substance, usually a sugar-based solution. Dextrose. Dextrose. Dextrose is simultaneously nutritive and slightly irritating. So you inject dextrose into an area. It, it, it basically tricks the body into thinking that it's been re-injured and launches a healing cascade. I did that for a number of years and it worked very well. It worked well in people who were in overall good health. Then platelet rich plasma came along. Platelet rich plasma, as the name implies, it's a blood PRP, draw. PRP. PRP, right. So you take a patient, you take their blood, you put it in a centrifuge, you concentrate down the platelets. Platelets are what are responsible for clotting after injury, but also they are what release the the protein signals to trigger your own stem cells, the own stem cells that exist in your tissue to activate. Well, PRP worked quite a bit better than prolotherapy. Mm. So for a period of four years, that's all I did was platelet-rich plasma. Then in 2010, I had a patient come to me and she brought me a stack of scientific articles about the use of bone marrow stem cells uh, for the treatment of arthritis. And back then it was all animal studies because that's all we had. And she said, I want you to inject my bone marrow into my knee. And I said, Laura, I, I don't know how to do that. I, I said, I know, I've heard of a guy in St. Louis that does it, you can go to him. And she said, I don't wanna go to him, I wanna go to you, I want you to do it. <laughs> so I learned how to do it. And I was so blown away with how well it worked that that became she a arthritis of her knee? Of her knee, yeah. And she had, stuck a little stem cells in there? And... We did a bone marrow aspiration, concentrated her bone marrow stem cells, and injected it into her knee. Well, then I started doing it with well, all my patients. What happened to her knee? Her knee got better and it was, and th this was a case, she wasn't getting better with PRP and before that she wasn't getting better with prolotherapy, but with the bone marrow stem cells, that actually worked. And that's what I found is that bone marrow stem cells work so much better than PRP or prolotherapy. That's why I started so early and then how I got so many numbers. In the early days, there were so few people, no one had heard of stem cells. So I was commuting to Brazil and there they had, I was just doing like, hundreds of cases i'd go down there and they'd line up all these bone marrow cases so i was you know while i was building while people i was waiting for you know sort of the the news to catch up i was going down there doing just tons of cases wow and um yeah and i, so I tell some of the stories of patients that you actually treated and what the response was well i mean these are what's 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 important to to talk about is who is a candidate for for stem cell therapy, because, you know, as we were just talking about right before we started shooting, um, there's all this data that shows that how bad a person's MRI looks or how bad their x-ray looks really doesn't give you that much information. There are lots of people who have perfectly good looking x-rays, MRIs with lots of pain, and there's people with terrible looking x-rays and MRIs and have no, no, pain. no pain at all. So it calls. I want to be that guy because my, my films look terrible, but I want to be the guy with the. <laughs> right. So that calls into question what's the pain generator? 
And what we think of is that, for example, nonspecific low back pain is a, is a problem of the microscopic tissue. It has really very little to do with what the x-ray shows or what the MRI shows, but it has to do with the, the collagen fiber matrices and the microcirculation, which does not show up on MRI. So when you have, you know, when you have in irregular collagen fibers and you have irregular micro uh, blood vessels, then that is what is causing pain. And one of the things that we know that stem cells do is they improve the microscopic health of tissue. And the mm. reason we know that is because one of the areas that enjoys the best scientific literature, the strongest scientific support is in wound care. You have somebody who has a non-healing ulcer, you know, they've got a wound that will not heal, will, will not heal. You inject stem cells and suddenly the wound heals. Well, how does a wound heal? Two ways. Collagen lays down in the proper orientation and you suddenly sprout these, these healthy blood, blood vessels right. and then skin grows over top. Yeah. So that's what we think is happening with people with yeah. chronic pain is we're put, putting stem cells in the area and their, the health of that microscopic tissue improves. So you're using a lot of chronic pain treatments and um, Dr. Kellen, you're using the same kind of therapies, but in a different way, you're using it for more healthy aging, for regenerative techniques that improve skin health and hair restoration and sexual optimization. All that sounds pretty awesome. Better skin, better hair, better sex. Right. <laughs> How does that work? So it's the same kind of idea. If you think about the wound healing model, for instance, you know, we know that for, for skins, if we inject stem cells in the skin, it's kind of like, um, like with wound healing, it increases your own skin's production of collagen, which is important for forming the structure of your skin. It improves your elastin, which is important for the sort of bounce back of your skin, um, and hyaluronic acid, which is important for hydration. So these stem cells, when we give them to you and your skin, it tells your own skin, fibroblasts and stem cells, hey, look, we gotta get back to work and make some of, make some new skin. And so you get healthier skin, um, mm. which is what we're, what we're after. Um, also better blood flow, so same kind of thing. So the, the mechanism of action is actually similar in all different parts of the body. Same thing with the sexual injections. So we know that when we do, when we inject, for instance, penises, when, you know, from animal models and human. Sounds like a terrible idea. I know, I know. Too much to inject penises. We, sounds like a scary we do, thing. We do know, <laughs> when we, I mean me, I do numb at first. So okay, everything, right, it's actually right, not that just, bad. But, um, but when you inject it. Terrifying you know, listeners. <laughs> You I'm used to having running to terrifying. From this yeah, I know. <laughs> come back, come back. Um, but when we inject into that area, we actually see improved blood vessel formation, have some nerve regeneration in some studies that has been shown, which is amazing, yeah. um, and improved health of the smooth vessel cells inside the, the corporate cavernosa, which are the tubes that fill with blood. Yeah. So it's the same types of uh, regenerate, regeneration, you know, no matter where we put the cells, um, but they just, it's different tissues that we're affecting. Amazing. And, um, in terms of just healthy aging, right? Um, what if you don't have a problem and you just want to live a long time and be healthy? Is it something that's worth thinking about? There are actually a lot of studies being done right now looking at using stem cells um, uh, given IV, and we don't do that specifically for that purpose, but given IV to decrease symptoms of frailty of aging. And they've shown that with giving, you know, giving IV injections of stem cells, you can actually improve things like, you know, older people's ability to walk longer distances and, you know, and, and brain fog and mood and all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. So I think that'll be something that we see a lot more of in the future. Um, but for me, like with the skin, for instance, I have some patients who look at stem cells injected into the skin who don't really have a lot of problems. There are actually some studies that show that stem cells are protective against some of the oxidative stress and damage um, of the sun or other environmental right. toxins right. and things like that. So, if, you know, even if you don't have necessarily have things you're trying to correct right now, there's the potential that with these kinds of therapies, you're actually protecting yourself to some degree from some of the other stressors that are out there. Amazing. So I'm going to be a guinea pig today. I'm going to have it all done. My back, my face, all the right. shots. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, so my telomeres are 39. Does that mean my face is going to look 39 when I'm done with it? Sure. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so give us a little more explanation about stem cells and, and how they work to affect biological aging. And they just kind of go wherever the issues are. Like what if you have beginnings of Alzheimer's, or you have Parkinson's, or you have, you know, an autoimmune disease, or you have increasing arthritis, inflammation. What does the future look like for stem cells in this? Well, well, one of the things with aging that we know, one of the main causes of aging is inflammation, chronic inflammation. Of course, that leads, uh, you know, as you know, leads to 
all different specific problems, whether that's coronary artery disease or Alzheimer's disease or any number of other diseases. And um, we, there's also some important information about stem cells and how they affect inflammation. Their, the, their interplay between your body's stem cells and, and inflammation is very important and having enough stem cells to, to keep inflammation at bay and kind of keeping that balance is important. And so one of the things that, that we think happens uh, and it's been shown to happen as you age is that kind of gets out of, out of yeah. balance and you get higher levels of inflammation, which of course are made worse by things like diet and, mm -hmm. and toxins and stress and all these other things. Um, and maybe we don't have the right balance anymore with the stem cells. Um, so that's one of the ideas sort of behind yeah. some of so these they're stem cell therapies. They're anti-inflammatory. And, and, and aging has been called inflammaging. Mm -hmm. Right. So right. all the diseases that we see of aging are all inflammatory. Heart disease, cancer, diabetes, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's. Right. You name it. You don't think of these as inflammatory diseases, but they're all inflammatory. And yeah. so maybe the stem cells help with modifying them. Right. And then you also need stem cells to heal. I mean, obviously you need stem cells in every part of your body that's going to have an injury in order to heal it. So those are the cells that are replicating and healing that injury. Um, so as you get older and you have fewer and fewer stem cells, you, it becomes harder and harder to heal, which makes sense. If you have, you know, if you have a kid who cuts their skin, you know, it heals up in like two days and it's no problem. Whereas if you have like a 65 year old who cuts their skin, you know, that's one of those things that it, it, it doesn't heal that quickly. It's a super slow process. They're going to have a scar. Yeah. And all of that's because of stem cells and lack of stem cell activity as we get older because you just don't have as many and not, not as active. Amazing. I just did a big cut on my finger and it's like amazing how it just healed. <laughs> wow, crazy. I smashed my nail in the car and I was growing up. It looks perfect. It's pretty awesome. The body is amazing. Then you've got good stem cells. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> um, so, uh, Harry, you, um, you, you really have done a lot of work thinking about where the stem cells come from, which ones to use. And I think, you know, as someone who's a physician, I hear the science, I hear the literature, um, and it's a little confusing. There's umbilical cord stem cells, there's embryonic stem cells, there's bone marrow stem cells, there's adipose or fat tissue stem cells. Can you walk us through the pros and cons of each of these and what sure. people are using and what you should be wary of and concerns? Because I had a patient once who had somebody else's stem cells injected and had issues with it. So mm -hmm. can you tell us a little bit more about Sure, sure. So there's essentially two main categories. There's autologous and allogenic. The word autologous means donor and recipient are the same person. So it's your own stem cells. Your own stem cells. And that's mostly what we do here. And it's really what we could build a reputation on is using stem cells from a person's own body. Yeah. So there's two sources of stem cells. So giving yourself your own blood transfusion. It's way better than giving somebody else. Precisely, blood. precisely. There's no question at all about the safety. So there's bone marrow. Bone marrow is the tried and true. It's been around for many years because it's been used with uh, bone marrow trans. It's been used with bone marrow treatment for cancer. So you know you take somebody's bone marrow, someone who has cancer. You take their bone marrow out. You give them chemotherapy to, to basically destroy a lot of their cells, and then you reinfuse their own stem cells. So that's been around a long time. And it's been used therapeutically for the longest for musculoskeletal conditions. There's the first appearances of the treatment of avascular necrosis, which is where you have actually the joint starts to die. And no blood flow into that. Right. That's, that's been around for, I think, close to 20 years at this point. And that's uh, really sort of the workhorse of autologous stem cells is bone marrow. The newcomer is fat-derived stem cells. Fat is very rich in stem cells. It has a much higher count of stem cells than bone marrow does. Uh, the problem is it's more complicated to isolate the stem cells. And um, there's, there's some question, in, you know, the FDA has issued a position that they feel that it's uh, beyond minimal manipulation. So there's some question as to the legality um, and there's there's many people in the uni United States doing it. We're all kind of waiting to see what the final decision is because there isn't really a definitive final so decision. The practice has got to hit the regulation. Exactly. So we, what I personally use both because I found that bone marrow works very very well, but it usually takes several treatments to get somebody where they want to be. Fat, when it works, it seems to work better than bone marrow but it has a higher non-responder rate. So I started using the two together and I seem to get the consistency of the bone marrow and the augmented improvement of the fat. 
And then, you know, we'll just see over the next few years which direction the regulation goes. And, you know, I may have to stop doing fat. And if it comes to that, then we'll stop doing it. So those are autologous. Then there's allogenic. Allogenic means it comes from someone else. Mm. So there's, you mentioned embryonic. Embryonic has really fallen out of favor uh, for two reasons. One is that there's a, clearly there's an ethical issue because an embryo is, can be argued is a human life. And so it's really not used anymore. But, the, but beyond that, beyond just the ethical argument, embryonic stem cells, because they're so primitive, tend to do weird things. And that's where you hear about like someone going to Russia, getting embryonic stem cells and then getting a tumor. Or, you know, getting a, like a, a, especially something called a teratoma, which is like a ball of hair and teeth. It's a particularly nasty sounding tumor. Um, but because they're so primitive, it's very hard to predict what they're going to do. Mm-hmm. What is less, uh, di- what, what is less of an issue are these uh, umbilical cord, they're called birth tissue stem cells. So either umbilical cord or placenta. Now, um, these seem to have, these do not seem to have the same problems that embryonic stem cells have. As, as uh, Dr. Keelan was saying earlier, they, are, they, they, they hide themselves from the immune system, but um, there are people who, you know, understandably are nervous about taking somebody else's DNA into themselves. So that's why we've used exosomes. And you mentioned it in the introduction. So what X is going to ask you about that, it's right? So new, yeah, a whole new uh, kid on the block here. It is, and it's and they're fascinating. And so what it is is um, uh, exosomes are a laboratory takes, for instance, placental stem cells, and they culture expand them. So now you have hundreds of millions of them. Then they put them in and a you st- grow them in a petri dish, basically. Right. right. Yeah. Yeah. And then they put them in a stressful culture medium. What that means is you trick these cells into thinking that their host is under you duress. You give them a lot of emails. And- <laughs> <laughs> right. Got it. So you basically make them think that their host is under duress and they're preparing for lean times. So they sprout and excrete these vesicles filled with growth factors that mm. are called exosomes. Now, these exosomes are the actual active ingredient of stem cells. Mm. When we spoke earlier about the paracrine effect and our own stem cells exerting a paracrine effect, they exert that effect through the exosomes. And so the way the exosomes are like the superpowers of the stem cells, and yet they don't have any identity as far as DNA, so they're kind of safe. It's, it's the active ingredient of stem cells without the other person's DNA. Yeah. And what makes the very, you were asking earlier, what makes your stem cells, 58 year old stem cells is as we age, our stem cells lose the ability to manufacture these very exosomes. And that is what makes my, my exosomes are 50 my, or my stem cells are 50 year old stem cells. What makes my stem cells, 50 year old stem cells is we lose the ability to manufacture these exosomes. So what we think happens, and this is based on the literature that exists on the use of exosomes therapeutically, is when you give exosomes, when you add them to your own stem cells, the membranes are identical, but it doesn't contain DNA. So we think our own stem cells actually absorb them into themselves, thereby rendering our own stem cells a younger person's stem cell. So it's sort of like it sort of superpowers your own stem cells when you give them together. That's what we think is happening. Do you ever give them alone? Uh, we, I don't have any experience with it just because people who come, I, I've found value in using your own stem cells. Like what we're going to do with you today is take your bone marrow stem cells, turbocharge them with exosomes, and then um, inject. We're going to, well, we'll talk about this a bit more. We're going to do a full body stem cell makeover, uh, slightly abridged version. Yeah. Amazing. So um, the stem cells have this amazing capacity to repair, regenerate, heal. The exosomes seem to add to that value. If you give exosomes IV, what happens intravenously? Uh, well, we don't because it, that's too much of a gray area legally. So we, we just give it as musculoskeletal injections. But Is there uh, any research on that? Um, there, there is a small body of, of literature and it's mostly about renal function, about people's kidney function, sure. and it's very promising. People with with, with uh, kidney failure receiving exosomes. So we're going to hear more about these exosomes. It sounds like. Oh, I think absolutely. Now, um, you put people under. Um, you you don't do all their awake. You give them sedation. So why do you use IV sedation for 
these treatments because I've, I've had various treatments done and they don't put you out mm -hmm. and uh, you do. Yeah. How do you do that? Um, well, we do big treatments. We do large treatments. And my experience has been, and I'm going to let the anesthesiologist explain exactly what it is that we do. But um, my experience has been that since I started sedating everybody, my, in, my outcomes have improved. And the, I think the reason for that is having a bone marrow aspiration, having a liposuction, having your entire spine injected in a single sitting is extremely uncomfortable. And people uh, are mad at me afterwards. They yeah. have a resentment. Yeah. You know, I put them through a very- I suppose they take a very long nap and they wake up feeling great. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, and as opposed to just taking a nap, waking up, and we're done. And I'll yeah. I'll let Dr. Duckworth talk about I've done exactly that. Like, what it is. What happened? Oh, we're done. I'm like, what? That was pretty amazing. <laughs> Before we get it, Dr. Hurley, I just want to back up a little bit um, and ask Amy about why you don't use bone marrow for some of the techniques you use. You use fat cells and you use PRP. Why do you not use the bone marrow? So you can, and certainly there are studies using bone marrow cells for all the different procedures that I do. Um, but I find that with the facial injections, for instance, there's a lot more bruising with the bone marrow cells um, than there is with just, I, I usually, I use PRP cells from fat and exosomes. So I, that's kind of the thing, the things that I use. And I can use any combination of those things, but that's kind of what I use. Um, but I, I mean, I, I, it's not impossible. Certainly some of the sexual health studies and men have been done with bone marrow cells and they've, they've been- they've What been if good. you get someone like me who has 6.2% body fat? Yeah, I mean, but you know, bone marrow cells are certainly a possible. It's just that you just may yeah. have more bruising. Like, yeah. But you know, if you don't mind a little bruise, then. <laughs> and they work as well. Uh, we don't know for sure. There's, they haven't done comparative trials between the two of them, at least for for skin and, and sexual function. There are studies in each with using each different type of cell and yeah. cell products and exosomes mm -hmm. and PRP that all are promising and all are good. But we don't know, for instance, you know, how much better is this versus this and and, and that sort of thing yet. Okay, well, let's come back to my upcoming extended nap. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> with uh, Dr. Duckworth. <laughs> You're an anesthesiologist. What is the difference between general anesthesia and IV sedation? Because most people are a little afraid of anesthesia. They go out and they're going to put a tube down my throat, I'll be out, there's complications, I've heard it causes brain damage. Uh, would I really, why would I want to do that? But you do something a little bit different. So can you talk about the difference and what that is? Yeah, so there is definitely a difference between general anesthesia and sedation. Uh, anesthesia is a kind of a continuum. On one end, you have mild sedation or anxiolysis then moderate sedation, deep sedation, and then general anesthesia. Um, and because it's a continuum, patients oftentimes can go from one level of sedation to the other. And to be honest, it's oftentimes difficult to tell exactly what level of sedation someone would be in. Um, just because someone's in general anesthesia doesn't necessarily mean that they need a breathing tube. Um, you can still have a general anesthetic where they're breathing spontaneously um, during the procedures up here, most of the time we're in the deeper end of sedation, okay? The anesthetics that we use today are ultra short acting, which is very nice because it allows me to kind of tailor my anesthetic um, to the patient and the procedure. Uh, we've done countless procedures up here and I know when a stimulating part of their procedure is coming up and I anticipate it and kind of ramp up my anesthetic knowing that in five to 10 minutes, what I gave them is gonna kind of come back down. So before some of the more stimulating parts of the procedure, um, I'll, you know, anticipate those, give them a little bit more. Um, I kind of look at the procedures we do here, um, bookend by two stimulating parts, the harvesting of the stem cells during the middle, they're kind of preparing the stem cells for injection. There's virtually no stimulating part of that for you. So commonly during that phase, I'll lighten up the anesthetic quite a bit mm -hmm. in an effort to give you less anesthetic to make recovery quicker for you and use less you know, drugs. Um, and then when we come back for the injection part, obviously there's some stimulation involved with that as well. Some injections more stimulating than others. And we can kind of just, we use yeah. a lot of aviation analogies. We can kind of, I can take you up to an altitude here. Yeah. We kind of come down here. I got a lot of control over those anesthetics. How do you tell where someone's in that spectrum? You know, you don't, Say, hey, you know. Yeah, <laughs> you, you, verbal cues is part of it. Um, under moderate sedation, by definition, you'll respond purposely to my cues. Mm -hmm. You mind lifting up your head. And a, someone under moderate sedation should follow verbal commands. But On they top, won't remember it. No, they won't remember it. <laughs> and that's kind of the difference. A patient between, it. between moderate sedation and general anesthesia, it's going to feel the same to most patients. Um, and then with general anesthesia, you get a tube in your throat, they're much stronger anesthetics. I remember when I had back surgery, I woke up, I was like, 
so out of it and I was yeah. vomiting and it was like a terrible thing. And these new anesthetics are super light and I, you know, it's like, yeah, get your colonoscopy, do the same thing, propofol, yes. which is what you use, right? Yeah. And a combination of propofol, we use some Remy fentanyl as well, which is a, a very pain killer, a painkiller that's metabolized in the plasma. So it's very short acting. It, yeah. it has a duration of action of a couple minutes. Uh. And, and then it's gone. So before we come up with the stimulating part, I give you a small dose of that. It's going to take away that pain stimulus and it's worn off. It's like playing music. Almost. Yeah. yeah, sure. <laughs> You're an artist. It's awesome. So people shouldn't be worried about IVC. They, they, re they really shouldn't. Very safe. And then um, think about how many colonoscopies there are. They do the same sort of thing. Uh, you know, it's just a very common thing. Michael Jackson died of it, but that's because he had way too much and Nobody was monitoring him. He was and and that's the big issue with there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not not the medication. Sometimes propofol, you know, gets blamed for that one, but it definitely wasn't propofol's fault. <laughs> so now let's, let's get into the weeds a little bit. Amy and uh, Harry, what are the conditions that you treat? What are the types of things that really respond to this? Who should be interested in it? Is it something for everybody or is it only a problem? What, give us the lowdown on, on your, your home runs and then the shady areas where it's maybe not as, as much indicated. You want to start? Sure, I'll go first. So I only treat musculoskeletal pain. Um, the full body stem cell makeover is slightly different because that's an anti-aging treatment. But for We're gonna get into that, but yeah. for my the conditions that I treat is musculoskeletal pain conditions. So low back pain, neck pain, joint pain. Where just in the simplest terms, where stem cell therapy after you know really twenty years of practicing regenerative medicine and ten years of doing stem cell therapy. What I found is that the, the conditions that respond the best are people who have pain, but they still have decent function. So in the low back, that means somebody who has non-specific low back pain, or you know maybe it's very focalized low back pain, but it's not to the point where they're, they have like foot drop, or they don't have you know they're they're not incontinent or something like that. In neck, you know, it's people have neck pain, but they ha they're not like dropping things. They haven't lost the use of their hand. Similarly with like a hip or a knee, it's pain in that joint, but that joint isn't like popping, clicking, sticking in place. They don't have full range of motion because the bones actually have changed shape. Mm -hmm. This works very well for the treatment of pain, but it does not restore function as much. Mm -hmm. Very good. So Amy, how about you? So mine are a little different, you know, I, for, for cosmetic purposes, anyone can be a good candidate, but certainly like for the face, it's, it's helpful. These stem cells are helpful for things like improving texture and tone of the skin, improving like fine lines and wrinkles, um, just kind of giving your face kind of a healthy glow and newness. Um, it's also great for, for hair. I do a lot of hair injections for both men and women to restore hair in areas that it's starting to thin or even just to make hair thicker. Mm -hmm. A lot of women who come in who have pretty good hair, but they just want sort of thicker, healthier hair, mm -hmm. and these be effective for that. And then for the sexual injections for men, I treat a lot of men with erectile dysfunction, varying degrees of erectile, erectile dysfunction, um, as well. Can as, they throw in the Viagra after that? Or you what? know, it depends on where they're starting from. It, you know, and I also recommend using it in combination with something like the low intensity shockwave therapy and games wave treatment, yeah. um, which is really effective as well. Um, and you know, it's it's kind of I take kind of an integrative approach. You know, make sure testosterone is is high enough. Make sure that your diet is good. You know, all the things that are important for ED it's not just one thing yeah. but um but if you, if you add all the things together with like stem cell therapy uh, and chocolate therapy then I definitely see improvements in that um, I treat a lot of men with Peyronie's disease which is a scarring disease that can cause ED and some curvature um, but I also treat patients who don't really have a lot of problems they're just like could this be better and that's be both better. men and women so like enhancement yeah just enhancement and you know people come back and say yeah it's better it actually it's could be better too, right? <laughs> and for women so I do uh, sort of a, with an O shot, o -shot. With, the, with stem cells, it's kind of a turbo O shot, I call it, um, where I'm using the PRP, stem cells, exosomes, all of those things um, wow. for women. It and, works. Uh, and same kind of thing, you know, improve sensitivity, improve, improve pre pleasure, um, vaginal lubrication can improve. Even stress and confidence symptoms can improve mm. sometimes, which is which is great for women who, who don't have you know a lot of other options out there for that. Now you guys have created something called the full body stem cell makeover, which sounds both... <laughs> Exciting and a little scary. So <laughs> tell us, tell us what that is and what does it do and who's it for? Sure. So um, we've sort of developed a reputation as the clinic that does big treatments. Part of that is because we work with Dr. Duckworth and he's so good and he's um, also very reasonably priced. So we started 
really providing sedation to everybody. The other reason is we have uh, sort of gained traction with Western Canadian farmers, ranchers, and oil field workers. And we get these people who literally, I affectionately say they've exceeded the terms of their warranty. And they have arthritis throughout their entire bodies. So we would get these people in and you know treat their entire spine and both hips and both knees and both shoulders. And I would sort of jokingly refer to it as full body stem cell makeover. Well, then Dave Asprey became a patient. And then we started getting the biohacking crowd. And I, as we were really sort of, I was getting more and more people that were asking me, well, can't you just inject my entire body in a single sitting? And I was on vacation. I was with my, my wife and my, my daughters. And I was looking out at the ocean and I was sort of having this this pensive moment and thinking about this path that I've taken. And really what set me on this path was rolfing. Rolfing is a type of body work where it's very comprehensive. You do, you massage the entire body over 10 sessions in order to address the entire structure. Yeah. And I started thinking about that. And I started thinking about these requests that I was getting for these, these full body treatments. And I thought, you know, what if I were, you know, what, what about a full body stem cell makeover? What if we were to sedate somebody, take a large volume of bone marrow, uh, turbocharge that bone marrow with exosomes, possibly also use fat drive stem cells, and then in a single sitting, inject the entire spine from the base of the skull down to the tailbone, flip them over, both elbows, or both shoulders, both elbows, both wrists and thumbs, both hips, both knees, both ankles, and great toe, and People love it. We've had, we've done quite a few. So what, what and then, notice? well, and then then I started. Then I thought, well, then I need to invite Dr. Killen and have her do all of her injectors injections. Do the skin of the hair and face. Do the skin of the scalp for the to improve the health of the hair. Do the face. Do the O shot, P shot, and um, and you know, sort of. This is the the concept being that this is the most comprehensive stem cell upgrade ever conceived. This is really an anti aging treatment. Mm. And what the what if you don't like. My knees are fine. Like, why would I inject my knees? Well, it would only be if you, if you, you know, then like we're going to do a bit of a modified treatment with you today. We're going to do a full spine makeover. We're going to inject your entire spine. We're going to skip the entire body just because you have to travel tomorrow. And I think really you need to have two days of rest to do for yeah. a full body stem cell makeover. But the idea would be just to prevent problems later in life. Yeah. yeah. So the idea. Well, I come back for an upgrade. Sure. Yeah. 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 We, we need to uh, touch up. And the uh, the treatment, you know, sounds like a little scary, but do people feel okay Sur after? What's surprisingly, the, the... people are fine. And I think a lot of it is since we started using exosomes, there's much less post procedure soreness. People wake up and they're actually fine. Amazing. All right. Um, so who who should think about it? Like who who like is this for everybody or? People, you know, biohackers, people who want to be completely proactive about their specifically their musculoskeletal health. At this point in time, it's not covered by insurance. No. Uh, it's kind of pricey. Yeah. But um, eventually, that's all going to come down, right? Just like everything. Um, you know, it's, yeah. I mean, all of it is, is coming down. Full body stem cell makeover is pricey. It's a lot of work. It's a huge volume of exosomes. So, the, you know, the, the cost of just the exosomes is quite high. It's a lot of work. It's about three hours of solid work for all three of us yeah. and the rest of my staff. Mm. Uh, but a portion of it does go, of all the full body stem cell makeovers, a portion of it goes to uh, subsidize a, a tithing program that we're launching starting in June. Yeah, yeah. So what we're doing is starting in June, we will be offering... Uh, stem cell therapy to, pe to people who can uh, document that they're uh, financially unable to, to yeah, pay for the treatment. Work. And what we'll That's do great. is we will provide stem cell therapy uh, at no financial charge, but rather in exchange for documentation of community service hours. Maybe. So 60 hours of community service will purchase a stem cell treatment. That's great. So last thing I want to talk about something kind of interesting, which is how we activate our stem cells on our own. Because there's a lot of research about how to activate your body's own stem cells. Um, and it also has to do with, in a way, how we create healing in addition to injections, right? So functional medicine is all about activating the body's own healing systems. And then we do that through diet, through lifestyle interventions like sleep and exercise and stress reduction, meditation, nutritional support, supplements. All those things can help to 
activate the body's own healing response, which you also recommend in conjunction with the stem cells. It's not like you just take someone who's got a horrible lifestyle, give them stem cells, and it's going to fix everything. You have to do it all in concert, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, essentially the answer is functional medicine. I, I tell my patients to read Dr. Mark Hyman's book. Seriously. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, honestly, it's, you know, you just named it. It's, it's diet, exercise, sleep, and emotional balance. It's those four mm -hmm. things. Um, diet plays a tremendous, you know, this is all about this inflammation in inflammaging that you right. mentioned that, that the, the, the accelerated aging is a process of inflammation. So how do you reduce inflammation? How do you, how do you really nourish your own stem cell function? And it's through proper diet. Mm. It's through restorative sleep. It's through exercise and it's through uh, emotional balance and reduction of stress. Okay. So, so how do we activate our own stem cells? Like what, what does the science tell us about things that we can do to we'll start to activate our own healing cells? Well, I mean, it's the things that we just talked mm -hmm. about. I mean, specific, specifically things like intermittent fasting, we know can really do a, can really give you a big, you know, sort of boost in stem cell production. So time restricted eating, eating like mm -hmm. within an eight hour period, 16 mm -hmm. hours of not eating, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, whether you do it over just, you know, just certain hours each day, whether you do several days worth, mm -hmm. um, that, that, that can boost, uh, increase uh, stem cell activity. Um, exercise specifically can definitely Before you jump to exercise, diet yeah. also, other, other yeah. things can help, right? Mm -hmm. Ketogenic diets. Right. Yeah. I do the fasting mimicking diet. Dr. Walter Longo has pioneered a lot of work in this. Mm -hmm. Activates all the healing, reparative, regenerative mechanisms. It's sort of like regenerative medicine using food. Right. right? Yeah. It's that that's getting that balance between, um, uh, you know, whether it's you're doing totally keto or whether you're doing a little keto or a little paleo or a little fasting. But all of those things can have uh, good results as far as increasing stem cell activity. Um, and you know, we, we always talk to our patients mm -hmm. about about diet and how important that is. Because mm -hmm. if you have an unhealthy patient um, who's not doing all the right things, you know, these kinds of treatments are not nearly as effective. Mm -hmm. you know, we don't do treatments on smokers, for instance. If they're actively yeah. smoking, we just tell them we need you to stop smoking. You're drinking three liters of yeah, soda. Yeah, drinking a ton, yes. you know, or if your oh, diabetes oh, yeah. is uncontrolled, or you know, there's all different things. If you have impaired uh, ability to heal then we know you're not going to heal yourself, yeah. even if we give you all of the things that, yeah. you know, that, you, that could be useful. So that's really important as being fairly healthy coming in. Yeah, it's fascinating you say that because I remember being a medical student and resident in, in surgery. And uh, we, we used to have this term was called PPP. Uh, piss poor protoplasm, yes, which, uh, which, which is <laughs> short for piss poor protoplasm, which is kind of a medical, you know, inside joke about how people's tissues yeah. were unhealthy are not great. So you take someone who's eating garbage and junk food and soda, and they're overweight. You know, you put your you're operating on them, and their tissues literally fall apart in your hands. They don't, they, you can't sew it together as well. They're not as healthy and strong. So it's not just on the outside they look bad; it's like on the inside. And so in a way, those things can be modified to activate these, uh, our own healing systems. And then you can use stem cells and exosomes as a super boost, right? Yeah, right. absolutely. Very good. So how do people learn more about what you guys are doing if they want to come and check it out? Uh, for just for the, the musculoskeletal pain, it's Docere Clinics, D-O-C-E-R-E -E Clinics, one word. DoceriClinics.com. And for the uh, skin and sex, as I call it, it's uh, Doceri <laughs> Medical. So D O C E R E Medical.com. Amazing. So um, I'm excited. I'm about to go under. <laughs> I'm going to tell you all about it. Maybe another podcast. We'll do a rerun for uh, showing how I do because uh, I'm really excited about this. I'm excited to try it. Thank you for offering this to me and helping me out. And uh, I, uh, I think this is really the future of healthcare. Is, regenerative medicine. It's what functional medicine is all about. It's about activating the body's own healing system. It's about using nature instead of heavy duty chemicals and drugs and surgery and activating the body's own reparative and regenerative systems. And it, science around this is just exploding. Uh, it's so exciting to be in medicine at this time. And we can see folks like you are really pioneering this work and you were in it before anybody knew what stem cells were. So uh, <laughs> this is a place to go. So thanks for being on the podcast. Thank you Dr. so much. So much. Uh, everybody who's listening, if you enjoyed the podcast, uh, please leave a comment. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, share with your friends and family on social media. And we'll see you next time on The Doctor's Pharmacy.